So uh, this is what I've been working on for the last five years. It's the first time I've uh, given it a public outing. So uh, forgive me if I read from a text, which is not my normal style, but this is the first time uh, it's been aired in public. One of the very first Indian words to enter the English language was the word loot. It's a piece of Hindustani slang. Uh, rooted in, uh, in Persian and Urdu uh, and was completely unknown in these islands until in the mid 18th century it became a very common word in common usage around the British Isles. And to understand how this happened you've only got to go to this place which is Powys Castle, uh, the Welsh border's answer to Traquair, uh, uh owned by the Clive family. The core of Powys is a 13th century castle built by the English for the last King of Wales when they took his land and they rewarded him uh, with this uh, piece of uh, architecture as a, uh, as a sop, uh, having taken his kingdom. But inside the castle, you find evidence of a much more violent... Uh, and far more global moment of English appropriation uh, and subjugation of a people. Because inside Powys Castle, there are more Mughal artifacts in one private house in Wales that are on, than are on display in any museum in India, even the National Museum in Delhi. In the display cabinets of this private Welsh house, you find hooker water pipes of burnished gold and empurpled ebony, superbly inscribed badakshan spinels and jeweled daggers, gleaming rubies the color of pigeon's blood and scatterings of lizard green emeralds. There are tiger's heads set with topaz, ornaments of jade and ivory, silken hangings, statues of Hindu gods and coats of armor. In pride of place, stand two great war trophies, taken after their owners had been defeated and killed. One is the palaquin of the Nawab of Bengal, Siraj Dawla, taken when he fled the battlefield of Plassey. And the other is the campaign tent of Tipu Sultan, the Sultan of Mysore. Such is the dazzle of this incredible treasure trove that, as a visitor last summer, I nearly missed the huge framed canvas that explained how this loot came to get here. The picture stands in the shadows at the top of a dark oak panel staircase. It's not a masterpiece, but it does repay close study. An effete Indian prince, wearing cloth of gold, sits high on his throne under a silken canopy. On his left, stand the scimitar and spear-carrying officers of his own army. To the right, a group of powdered and periwigged Georgian gentlemen. The prince is eagerly thrusting a scroll into the hands of a statesman-like, slightly overweight Englishman in a red frock coat. The painting shows a scene from August 1765, when the young Mughal emperor, Shah Alam, exiled from Delhi and defeated by the troops of the East India Company, was forced into what we might today call an act of involuntary privatisation. The scroll that he's handing to Clive is an order to dismiss his own Mughal revenue officers in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa and replace them with a set of English traders appointed by Robert Clive, the governor of Bengal, and the director of the company, who in the document is described as the high and mighty, the noblest of exalted nobles, the chief of illustrious warriors, our faithful and sincere well-wishers, worthy of royal favours, the English company. The collector of Mughal taxes was henceforth to be subcontracted to a powerful multinational corporation whose revenue-collecting operations were protected by its own private corporate security force. 
This was the moment that the East India Company ceased to be a conventional trading organization dealing in silks and spices and became something much more unusual. Within a few years, 250 company clerks, backed by the military force of 20,000 locally recruited sepoys, Indian soldiers appointed by the company as its own defense force, became the effective rulers of Bengal, the richest area of India. An international corporation was in the process of transforming itself into an aggressive colonial power. By 1803, only 40 years later, that private army, answerable only to the directors and shareholders of the company, had grown to 260,000 men, twice the size of the actual British army. And within that same period, it quickly subdued and seized an entire subcontinent that was then the richest area of the globe. Astonishingly, this whole process took only half a century. The first ser serious territorial conquest began in Bengal in 1756. 47 years later, the company's reach extended as far north as Delhi, the ancient Mughal capital, and almost all of India south of that city was subjected to the rule of a boardroom in the city of London, 16,000 miles away. What honour is left to us, asked a local Mughal official named Narayan Singh, when we have to take orders from a handful of traders who have not yet learnt to wash their bottoms. <laughs> we still talk, both in India and in Britain, about Britain conquering India. But that phrase disguises a much more sinister reality. It was not the British government that seized India at the end of the 18th century, but a dangerously unregulated private company, headquarters headquartered in one small office, five windows wide, and managed in India by an unstable sociopath, Clive. Hang on, where is he? The transition to colonialism, the principal framing context for all the major historical questions about African and Asian societies over the last 200 years, took place through the mechanism of a for-profit corporation which existed entirely for the purpose of enriching investors. In many ways, the East India Company was a model of corporate efficiency. Look at the size of its headquarters. It's a very modest building, much smaller than Traquair. <laughs> a hundred years into its history, it had only 35 permanent employees in that building. Nevertheless, the skeleton staff executed a corporate coup unparalleled in history, the military conquest and subjugation and plunder of vast tracts of southern Asia. It almost certainly remains today the supreme act of corporate violence in world history. For all the power wielded today by the likes of ExxonMobil or Walmart or, Glo or Glo Google, they are tame beasts beside the ravaging territorial appetites uh, of the East India Company. And history shows that the, in the intimate dance between the power of the state and the power of the company, while the latter can be regulated, companies will use all the resources in their powers to resist. Although its total trading capital was permanently loaned to the British state when it, when it suited, the company made much use of its legal separation from the government. It argued forcefully and successfully that the document signed by Shah Alam, uh, the Diwani document, uh, where are we? We've got it again? No, one back. Um, yeah. Uh, was the legal property of the company and not of the crown, even though the government had lent the company uh, several battleships and several regiments of infantry in order to win the Battle of Plassey and had spent around uh, a million pounds of taxpayers' money, which was a vast sum in the 18th century. But the MPs who made this uh, legal distinction were not exactly neutral. Many of them were already nabobs. These are the returned, uh, rich uh, East India Company 
officials who returned back to England with fortunes and used it to buy rotten boroughs, to buy uh, corrupt parliamentary seats. So that, uh, and many more, 50% of the MPs in Parliament had shares in the East India Company uh, and so did not want to, uh, to uh, sink the share price uh, of, of a company whose shares they owned. So the Parliament is already rigged seriously in favour of this ravaging uh, corporate beast. The transaction depicted in this picture losing it again, sorry, <laughs> but it's worth having it up on the screen, um, was to have catastrophic consequences for India. As with all such co uh, corporations then and now, it was answerable only to the shareholders. And with no stake in the just governance of the region or its long-term well-being, the company's rule quickly turned into the straightforward pillage of Bengal and the rapid transfer westwards of its wealth. Long before, uh, before long, the province, already devastated by war, was struck down by famine, then further ruined by high taxation. Company tax collectors were guilty of what today would be described as major human rights violations. A senior official of the old Mughal regime wrote in his diaries, we Indians are being tortured to disclose our treasure. Cities, towns and villages are ransacked. Estates and provinces purloined. These are the delights of the directors and their servants. Bengal's wealth was rapidly drained into Britain. And Scotland is as, uh, every bit as guilty in this uh, as England. There are many, uh, in, this is the 1760s and 17, 1770s, many of the gentry families who'd lost money in, in the 45 regained their family fortunes by going out to India and plundering there. Uh, and uh, people returned with vast fortunes. Many of the great 18th century houses uh, around these islands are built on corrupt Indian fortunes. Clive himself returned to Britain uh, with a personal fortune uh, of um, £234,000, which in, in the, the uh, money of that period made him the richest self-made man in Europe. After the Battle of Plassey in 1757, a victory that owed more to forgery and, uh, and uh, treachery and bankers and bribes than any military prowess, Clive transferred to the East India Company treasury no less than £2.5 million seized from the defeated rulers of Bengal in today's currency, around 23 million for Clive, uh, sorry, 23 million for the company and 250 uh, million for the company. Sorry, 23 million for Clive, 250 million for the company. No great sophistication was required. The entire contents of the Bengal treasury were simply loaded onto 100 boats and punted downstream, down the Ganges, from the Nawab's headquarters to Fort William. The painting of Clive and Shah Alam is actually very deceptive. The painter had never been to India, and even at the time, uh, someone noted that the uh, shape of the dome of the mosque in the background looked very like the dome of St. Paul's. Uh, as for the great uh, throne of Shah Alam uh, in the centre of the picture, uh, this had no uh, uh, resemblance to the actual throne, which was merely um, Clive's armchair, which had been hoisted onto a dining room table and covered with a chintz bedspread. <laughs> Later, the British dignified this document, uh, calling it the Treaty of Allahabad. This is Allahabad Fort, where it was signed. Though Clive had dictated the terms and the terrified Mughal emperor had simply waved them through. As a contemporary Mughal historian wrote, a business of such magnitude as left neither uh, pretense or subterfuge, which at any other time would have required the sending of wise ambassadors and able negotiators, as well as much parley and conference, uh, was done and finished in less time than would usually be taken for the sale of a jackass or a beast of burden or several head of cattle. But by the time that the original painting was shown at the Royal Academy, in 1795, no Englishman who had witnessed the scene was still alive. Clive, hounded by envious parliamentary colleagues and widely revived for corruption, committed suicide in 1774, slitting his own throat with a paper knife, some months before the picture was completed. 
He was buried in secret on a frosty November night in an unmarked vault of a Shropshire village church called Morton Say. Many years ago, workmen digging up a parquet floor came across Clyde's bones, and after some discussion, it was quietly decided to put them back and let them rest where they had lain. Here they remain, marked today by a small, discreet wall plaque inscribed Primus in Indus. Today, the site of the East India Company headquarters uh, lies underneath the Richard Rogers Glass and Metal Lloyds Building in the city of London, in Leadenhall Street. Unlike Clive's burial place, no blue plaque marks the site of what Macaulay called the greatest corporation in the world, and certainly the only one to equal the Mughals by seizing political power across the whole of South Asia. But anyone seeking a monument to the company's legacy need only look around them. No contemporary corporation could get away with duplicating its brutality, but many have attempted to match the company's success at bending state power to its own ends. The people of Allahabad, like those in London, have also chose to forget this episode in their history. The large redstone Mughal fort where the treaty was extracted from Shah Alam a much larger fort, incidentally, than the ones that tourists tro troop around in Delhi and Agra, uh, is still a closed-off military zone. And when I visited it last year, neither the guards at the gate nor their officers knew any events that had taken place there, nor had the sentries ever heard of the company whose cannons still dot the parade ground. Instead, their conversations were focused on the future and the reception of India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi on a trip to America. One of the guards proudly showed me the headlines of the Times of India, announcing that Allahabad had been the subject of discussions between the Prime Minister and the White House. The centuries were optimistic. India was finally coming back into its own, they said, after 800 years of slavery. The Mughals, the company and the Raj had all receded into memory, and Allahabad was now going to be part of India's resurrection. Soon we will be a great country, said one of the centuries, and our Allahabad will also be a great country. At the height of the Victorian Raj, after the state had taken control of India, there was a strong sense of embarrassment about the shady, mercantile way in which the British had founded the Raj. The Victorians thought the real stuff of history was the politics of the nation state. This not the economics of corrupt corporations, was, they believed, the fundamental unit of analysis and the major driver of change in human affairs. Moreover, they liked to think of the empire as a civilizing mission, a benign national transfer of knowledge, railways, and the arts of civilizations from east to west. And there was a, a calculated and deliberate amnesia about the shady corporate looting that actually opened British rule in India. A second picture, this one commissioned from William Rothenstein to hang in the House of Commons, shows how the official memory of this process was spun and subtly reworked. It now hangs in St. Stephen's Hall, the echoing reception area of Parliament, and I came across it by chance last summer, waiting there to see an MP. The painting was part of a series of murals entitled The Building of Britain, it features what the Hanging Committee at the Times regarded as the highlight and turning points of British history. Alfred the Great defeating the, Great, the Danes and the Parliamentary Union of England and Scotland in 1707. The image in this series, which deals with India, does not, however, show the handing over the Diwani to a company, but to an earlier scene. Let me go back. Um, where again a mogul prince is sitting on a raised dais under a canopy, and again we're in a court setting with bowing attendants and blowing trumpets. But this time, the balance of power is very different. Sir Thomas Rowe, the ambassador sent by James I to the mogul court, is shown appearing before the mogul emperor Jahangir in 1614, at a time when the mogul emperor was still the richest and most powerful state in the world. Jahangir inherited from his father Akbar, one of the two wealthiest polities of the world. This is Akbar coming up here. Um, along with Ming China. 
and his lands stretch through most of India, all of what is now Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, half of Afghanistan and a slither of Persia. He ruled over five times the population commanded by the Ottomans, roughly 100 million people. When Milton, sitting in England writing Paradise Lost, in the early 17th century, wanted to give a picture of the magnificence of God's future creation, he takes Adam on a worldwide whirlwind whistle-stop tour of world history. And one of the places they stop is in Mughal Lahore. This was no understatement, because uh, for the 17th century British, Mughal cities were like divine marvels uh, of, of uh, holy design. Agra, with a population of 700,000, dwarfed all the cities of Europe, while Lahore was larger than London, Paris, Lisbon, Madrid, and Rome combined. This was a time when India accounted for about a quarter of all global manufacturing. In contrast, Britain then contributed less than 3% of global manufacturing. And two-fifths of the population of Britain lived at subsistence levels. And the East India Company was so small at this point that it still operated from the home of its governor, Sir Thomas Smythe, with a permanent staff of only six. It did, however, already possess 30 tall ships and its own dockyard at Deptford. Jahangir, in this picture, flirted with a project to civilise India's European immigrants, who he described as an assembly of savages. But he later dropped the plan as unworkable. His son Jahangir, who had a taste for exotica and wild beasts, welcomed Sir Thomas Rowe with the same enthusiasm he'd shown for the arrival of the first turkey in India and questioned Rowe closely on the oddities of Europe. For the committee who planned the House of Commons painting, this marked the emergence of British rule in India, two nations coming into contact for the first time. But in reality, British relations with India had begun not with diplomacy and the meeting of envoys, but with trade. The founding charter of the East India Company authorised the setting up of what was then a radically new type of business. Not a family partnership like, for example, the Medici Bank, until then the norm all over the globe, but a joint stock company which could issue tradable shares on the open market to any number of investors, a mechanism capable of realising much larger amounts of capital. It was like... Uh, the equivalent today of sending an expedition to India today would be you know, sending an expedition to Mars. It required enormous sums of capital, more than any one family of merchants could possibly raise. So you create a new mechanism, which is the idea of a company where everyone can buy shares, and you invite everybody, rich and poor, to subscribe to it. And this is what happened. It's a new invention uh, in the 16th century. Six years before Rowe's expedition, Captain William Hawkins had landed at Surat, the first commander of a vessel to sail to Indian soil. Hawkins, a bibulous sea dog, made his way to Agra, where he accepted a wife offered to him by the Mughal emperor and brought her back to England. This was a version of history that the House of Commons decided to forget. The rapid rise of the East India Company was made possible by the catastrophic decline of the Mughals in the 18th century. This is Sir Thomas Rowe arriving uh, at the uh, Mughal court. This is the great splendour of Shah Jahan and the peacock throne, which uh, cost four times the Taj Mahal, uh, the cost of it to build. It was just filled with all the jewels that the Mughals had collected from across the world over six generations. And this was the last of the great Mughals, Aurangzeb, whose bigotry led to a fracturing of that empire. Uh, following that, uh, the Persian adventurer Nadir Shah, uh, this rather grim figure, came down, defeated the Mughals in battle. Uh, here's Nadir Shah with the, uh, the playful Muhammad Shah Rangilo, who didn't know anything about warfare at all. And he walked off with the, uh, with the entire uh, uh, Mughal treasury in 1739, leaving, it was like throwing a mirror out of a second floor window. The Mughal Empire fragments overnight as the treasury, which powered the engines of, uh, of, of the bureaucracy and the army, disappears. They just can't pay anyone. The empire fragments overnight. And the biggest winner of this is the East India Company. This is the flag of the company, a familiar 
uh, 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 arrangement uh, and the inspiration uh, for the flag of a later entity, uh, which follows uh, uh, a little bit after this. According to the Mughal historian Fakir Khairuddin, disorder and corruption no longer sought to hide themselves, and the once peaceful realm of India became the abode of anarchy. In time, there was no real substance for the Mughal monarchy. It had faded to a mere name or shadow. The same year that Nadir Shah the Persian returned home, uh, the French company Dazan began minting its own coins. And without anyone to stop them, both the English and the French began drilling their own sepoys, militarizing their operations. And it was the fall of the Mughals that facilitated the rise of these two companies. And then the British uh, company defeats the French one. As the Count of Modave, who had fought for the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam, noted, the empire held together while Aurangzeb reigned, and even for some years after he died in the years of the following century. For generally, beneficial laws have a certain inner strength which allows them, for a time, to resist the assaults of anarchy. But at last, a horrible chaos overtook the Mughal Empire. Any spark of good that Aurangzeb had done to promote con commerce was snuffed out. Ruthlessly ambitious Europeans were no less deadly in these parts, as if Europe and America were too small a theatre of war for them to devour each other, pursuing chimeras of self-interest, undertaking violent and unjust resolutions. They insisted on Asia, too, as the stage on which to act out their restless injustices. Before long, the East India Company, under this flag, was straddling the globe. Almost single-handedly, it reversed the balance of trade, which from Roman times had led to a continual drain of wealth and bullion eastwards. The East India Company ferried opium to China and in due course fought the opium wars in order to seize an offshore base in Hong Kong and safeguard the profitable monopoly in narcotics. To the west, it shipped Chinese tea to Massachusetts where its dumping in Boston Harbor triggered the American War of Independence. Indeed, one of the principal fears of the American patriots in the run-up to the war was that Parliament would unleash the East India Company in the Americas to loot there as it had done in India. In November 1773, the patriot John Dickinson described East India Company tea as a cursed trash and compared the future regime of the East India Company in America as being devoured by rats. This almost bankrupt company, he says, having been occupied in corrupting their country, Britain, and wreaking the most unparalleled barbarities, extortions, and monopolies in Bengal, has now cast their eyes on America as a new theater whereon to exercise their talents of rapine, oppression, and cruelty. And this is one of the main complaints you hear in, uh, at the beginning of the American Revolution, is this fear that the East India Company will be let loose on America. By 1803, the East India Company had conquered the Mughal Emperor, uh, Shah Alam, sitting blinded in his palace in Delhi. And with the, uh, with the private security force of 260,000, marshalled, marshalled more firepower than any nation state in the world. A mere handful of businessmen from a distant island on the rim of Europe now ruled dominions that stretch continually across North India from Delhi in the west to Assam. Uh, and the entire coast was in the company's hands, together with strategic points between Gujarat and Cape Comorin. In just 40 years, they made themselves masters of almost all the subcontinent, whose inhabitants numbered 50 to 60 millions. Succeeding an empire where even minor nawabs and governors ruled over vast areas larger in both size and population than the biggest countries in Europe. It was, as one of its directors admitted, an empire within an empire, with the power to make war or peace anywhere in the East. It had also by this stage created a vast and sophisticated administration and civil service, built much of London's docklands, and come close to generating nearly half of British trade. No wonder that the East India Company now referred to itself as the grandest society of merchants in the universe. Yet, like more recent mega corporations, the East India Company proved at once both hugely powerful 
and oddly vulnerable to economic uncertainty. Only seven years after the granting of the Diwani, when the company's share price had doubled overnight after it acquired the wealth of Bengal and all its treasury, the East India Company bubble burst after plunder and famine in Bengal led to massive shortfalls in revenues. The East India Company was left with debts of £1.5 million and a bill of £11 million in unpaid tax to the Crown. When the knowledge of this became public, 30 banks clapped across Europe, bringing trade to a standstill. It was like the no-deal Brexit of 1772. In a scene that seems horribly familiar to us today, this hyper-aggressive corporation had to come clean and, like the Royal Bank of Scotland, ask for a massive government bailout. In June the 5th, July the 15th, 1772, the directors of the East India Company applied to the Bank of England for a loan of £400,000. A fortnight later, they returned, asking for an additional £300,000. The bank was able to raise only £200,000. By August, the directors were whispering to the government that they would actually need an unprecedented sum of a further £1 million. The official report written by Edmund Burke foresaw that the East India Company's financial problems could potentially, like a millstone, drag the government down to an unfathomable abyss. This accursed company would, like a viper, be the destruction of the country which fostered it in its bosom. But unlike Lehman Brothers, the East India Company really was too big to fall. So it was in the following year, 1773, that the world's first aggressive multinational corporation was saved by history's first mega bailout, the first example of a nation state extracting, as a price for saving a failing corporation, the right to regulate it and severely rein it in. When I visited Allahabad, I hired a small dinghy and sailed below the fort's walls, up the Ganges, asking me to row the boatman uh, to, boat, to row me, sorry, asking the boatman to row me upstream. It was a beautiful moment, that moment anyone that's ever been to India will know well, what they call Goduli Bella, cow dust time. Uh, and the Yamuna and the Ganges glittered in the evening light as brightly as any of the gems of Powys. Egrets picked their way along the banks, past pilgrims taking a dip at the auspicious point of confluence where the Yamuna meets the Ganges. Ranks of little boys with fishing lines stood among the holy men and the pilgrims. Historians propose many reasons for the fracturing of the Mughal Empire. And looking out on this uh, enormous fort, uh, by far the largest in India, you wonder how such a magnificent and powerful empire could collapse before a bunch of traders. But perhaps the biggest company that allowed the biggest uh, factor that allowed the company to take over was the support it enjoyed from Parliament. The relationship between the company and Parliament grew more symbiotic throughout the 18th century. Returned nabobs like Clive uh, used their, uh, their steadily growing power to buy MPs and parliamentary seats, the famous rotten boroughs. In turn, the Parliament backed the company with state power, ships and soldiers which were needed to take on the French uh, and other powers. As I drifted past the walls of Allahabad, I thought about the nexus between the corporations and politicians in India today, a nexus which has delivered many individual fortunes to rival those amassed by Clive. The country today has only 6.9% of world GDP. Uh, the total wealth of India's billionaires, however, is equivalent to 10% of the nation's GDP, while the comparable ratio for Chinese billionaires is less than 3%. More importantly, many of these fortunes have been created by manipulating state power, using political influence, just like the company did, to secure rights to land and minerals, and flexibility in regulation. The uh, modern Indian situation has remarkable analogies to the situation of 18th century uh, uh, London. What is England now, fumed the Whig literateur Horace Walpole, but a sink of Indian wealth? In 1767, the company bought off Parliament from investigating it by donating £400,000 to the Crown in return for its continual right 
to continue governing Bengal. But the anger finally reached an ignition point in February 1788 uh, when, uh, the, when Warren Hastings uh, was impeached in Parliament. It was the nearest the British ever got to putting the East India Company on trial, and they did so with one of their greatest orators at the helm, Edmund Burke. Burke, leading the prosecution, railed against the way returned company nabobs were buying parliamentary influence, not just by bribing MPs to vote for their interests, but by corruptly using their Indian plunder to bribe their way into parliamentary office. Today, the Commons of Great Britain prosecutes the delinquents of India, thundered Burke. Tomorrow, these delinquents may be the Commons of Great Britain. Burke thus correctly identified what remains one of the great anxieties of modern liberal democracies, the ability of a ruthless corporation corruptly to buy a legislature. Just as corporations now recruit retired politicians in order to exploit their establishment contacts, the way that all the successive presidents of America have joined various of the large corporations like the Bushes, so today, uh, so for example, the uh, Lord Cornwallis, the man who oversaw the loss of the American companies, uh, was recruited by the East India Company to oversee its Indian territories when he retired from public life. As one observer wrote, of all the conditions, perhaps the most brilliant at the same time most anomalous is that of the Governor General of British India, a private English gentleman, the subject of a joint stock company. During the brief period of his government, he is the deputed sovereign of the greatest empire in the world, the ruler of a hundred million men while dependent kings and princes bow down before him with deferential awe and submission. There is nothing in history analogous to this. Hastings survived his impeachment, but Parliament did finally remove the East India Company from power following the great Indian uprising of 1857, some 60 years after Hastings' trial. On the 10th of May, 1857, the East India Company's own security force rose up against their employers, the sepoys, and on successfully crushing the insurgency after nine uncertain months, the company distinguished itself for the final time by hanging and murdering tens of thousands of its own, of its own sepoys uh, and other rebels in bazaar towns that line the Ganges. Probably the single bloodiest episode in the entire history of British colonialism. Enough was enough. The same parliament that had done so much to enable the East India Company to rise to unprecedented power finally gobbled up its own baby. The British state, alerted to the dangers posed by corporate greed and incompetence, successfully tamed history's most voracious corporation. In 1859, it was again in the walls of Allahabad Fort uh, that the G Governor General, Lord Canning, formally announced that the company's Indian possessions would be nationalised and passed to the control of the British Crown. Queen Victoria, rather than the directors of the East India Company, would henceforth be the ruler of India. The East India Company limped on in its amputated form for another 15 years, finally shutting down in 1874. Today, its brand name is owned by a Gujarati businessman uh, who uses it to sell, quote, condiments and fine foods from showrooms in London's West End. Meanwhile, in a nice piece of historical and karmic symmetry, the current occupant of P Powys Castle is married to a Bengali woman, and photographs of a very Indian wedding were proudly hung in the Powys National Trust Tea Room. Clive's future descendants will now be half Indian. Today, we are back in a world that will be very familiar to Sir Thomas Rowe, where the wealth of the West has begun again to drain East, in the same way as it did from Roman times up until the birth of the company. When a British Prime Minister visits India, he no longer comes, like Clive, to dictate terms. In fact, negotiation of any kind has passed from the agenda. Like Rowe, he comes as a supplicant, begging for contracts and business, and with him come the CEO uh, of Britain's biggest corporations. <laughs> for the corporation, the idea of a single integrated business organisation stretching out across the seas was one of the most revolutionary of European inventions. And it is contemporary with the beginnings of European colonialism that upended the trading world of Asia and Europe and helped give Europe its competitive edge.
It is, moreover, an idea that has continued to thrive long after the legacy of British colonialism in India has gone. When historians like to talk about the legacy of British colonialism, they usually mention uh, democracy, the rule of law, railway, tea and cricket. Yet the idea of a joint stock company is arguably Britain's most important export to India, and one that has, for better or worse, changed South Asian more than any other European idea. Its influence certainly outweighs that of communism and Protestant Christianity, and possibly even that of democracy. Companies and corporations now occupy the time and energy of more Indians than any other institution outside the family. This should come as no surprise. As Ara Jackson of uh, Harvard Business School recently noted, corporations and their leaders have displaced politics and politicians as the new high priests and oligarchs of our systems. Covertly, companies still govern the lives of a significant proportion of the human race. But the 300-year-old question of how to cope with the power and perils of large multinational corporations remains today without a clear answer. It's not clear how a nation state can adequately protect itself and its citizens from corporate excesses. As the international subprime bubble and bank collapses of 2007 to 9 have so recently demonstrated, just as corporations can enrich, mould and positively shape the destiny of nations, so they can also fatally drag down their economies. In all, US and European banks lost more than $1 trillion of tax toxic assets between January 2007 and September 2009. What Burke feared the East India Company would do to England in 1772 actually happened in Iceland in 2008, when the systematic collapse of all three of the country's major privately owned commercial banks brought the country to the brink of complete bankruptcy. A powerful corporation can still overwhelm or subvert a state every bit as effectively as the East India Company did in Bengal in 1765. Someone yesterday in a question talked about ITT and Chile and the overthrow of Allende. This is another example. Corporate influence with its fatal mix of power, money and unaccountability is particularly potent and dangerous in frail states where corporations are insufficiently or ineffectually regulated and where the purchasing power of a large company can outbid or overwhelm an underfunded government. This would seem to be in the case with the last Congress government that ruled India until 2014. But in the West, too, media organisations can bend under the influence of corporations and the nexus between business and politics is as tight as it has ever been. The East India Company no longer exists and has, thankfully, no modern equivalent. Walmart, which is the world's largest corporation in revenue terms, does not number among its assets a fleet of nuclear submarines. Neither Facebook nor Shell possess regiments of infantry. Yet the East India Company, the first great multinational corporation and the first to run amok, uh, is, was the ultimate model and prototype for many of today's joint stock corporations. The most powerful among them do not need their own armies. They can rely on governments to protect their interests and bail them out. The history of the East India Company is a study of the relationship between commercial and imperial power. It looks at how corporations impact on politics and vice versa. It examines how power and money can corrupt and the way that commerce and colonialization have often walked in lockstep. For Western imperialism and corporate capitalism were both born hand in hand, and both were the dragon's teeth that spawned the modern world. Such was the disruption that forces caused in 18th century India brought a whole new literary genre to, uh, to, uh, to birth to deal with it. These included the genre of moralizing histories known as the Book of Admonition or Brit Bratnama, or the ode to the ruined city, the Shah Rashob. The language of the greatest of these, the Abratnama of Fakir Khairuddin, is full of metaphysical allusions to, and to political turmoil of the late 18th century. And it says that for the admonitory purpose of these histories is this, by considering these past lives, wrote Khairuddin, take heed for your own future. <laughs> 
The East India Company remains today history's most terrifying warning about the potential for the abuse of corporate power and the insidious means by which the interests of the shareholder become those of the state. For our world has never been post-imperial and probably never will be. Instead, empire is transforming itself into forms of global power that use multinational finance systems, global markets, banking, corporate influence and international law, rather than, or sometimes alongside, avert military conquest, occupation, and direct economic domination. 315 years after the founding of the company, with a corporate mogul now sitting at the desk of the Oval Office, the story of the East India Company has never been more current. Thank you. If there are any questions. This way. It uh, may not be within the remit of your interesting talk, but I would be very interested if you could t possibly tell us something about how the moguls themselves acquired all the fabulous wealth that was then available for the East India Company to plunder. The, the moguls, like all empires, came through military conquest. Uh, and they were from what's now, I mean, the, the origin of them was originally in Uzbekistan. So it was a straightforward military conquest, as all empires were. So in that sense, the East India Company was nothing new. But what was different was that while the Mughals stayed in India and invested their wealth in, in, in India, building the Taj Mahal and the Red Fort, the company transferred its assets back to Europe. So what you get is, is Powys, the other great Georgian houses built by, uh, uh, by company officials, and a drain of, a, of two or three million pounds every year from India to Britain. At the back here. Could I ask, uh, just to relate to the, uh, the spoils of investment, who actually gets the benefits? And to link what was going on with slavery tobacco, sugar, particularly in the Atlantic sphere, and then the East India Company, which had been, from what you say, established earlier on, but came to its fore with the American Revolution, etc. What was the spread of the benefits to the British economy? So, I mean, overall, the British economy is obviously a, a massive net gainer because you have this fantastic transfer of Indian wealth into British pockets. Uh, and as I said, rather than, rather than investing it and settling it down in India, the company servants had a contract that lasted a, a set amount of time, and then they would return back to Britain, where they'd build grand Georgian country houses and buy parliamentary estates. The story that, that you're, you've touched on, though, that's most interesting is the idea of, of, of the, the importance of tea. Tea is initially grown in China. The East India Company buy it by introducing uh, opium uh, on a large industrial scale uh, in India. They, they buy the opium, make it into raw opium, sell it to China. Then they sell the, um, the, the tea in Britain, then America. At the same time, in order to sweeten it, the entire Caribbean slave economy is, uh, is created, which involves the, uh, the, the shipping of millions of black African slaves from West Africa to the Caribbean, uh, wiping out the indigenous Caribs. So this innocent thing, the cup of tea, uh, that we sit there uh, uh, sipping innocently at four o'clock every day uh, uh, is something that has this massive trail of bloodshed, uh, narco-terrorism and, uh, uh, and slavery behind it. At the back, Andrew. Yes, I spent quite a lot of time over the last few years in Indonesia and the Spice Islands. And I'm wondering, uh, um, certainly when I was there, the imprint and the wealth of the Dutch East India Company was enormous, and it was earlier than this. How did it compare with the British East India Company, and how did the British East India Company actually overcome it? So the Dutch were the first up. They, uh, they, they created a whole series of little companies 
uh, which so successfully cornered the spice trade uh, that the English East India Company, uh, uh, the, the, the well, sorry, originally the Levant Company, which ha was buying uh, spices in the Middle East from Venice, from Cairo, uh, from, uh, fr from uh, Aleppo and places like that, realized that their business was going to be destroyed and so founded the East India Company. The same people that had owned the Levant Company uh, create the East India Company as a way of taking on the Dutch. And initially, the Dutch defeat and outmaneuver the English East India Company. Uh, and um, the, uh, uh, there's this uh, war that goes on. And in the final treaty, the, all the Spice Islands are given to Holland, which is the big prize. And the British get as a sop a small island in the Hudson River called Manhattan. The rest is history. <laughs> One last, sir. Uh, where is the Enlightenment in all this? The, the Enlightenment which happens in Europe and happens in Scotland. Is this some part of it? So, it's, I mean, it's simultaneous. The, the, the Enlightenment is, you know, in, in the 1760s, 70s, 80s, uh, uh, Hume and, uh, and all this stuff in Edinburgh and elsewhere. Uh, is happening simultaneously. And what, one of the things that's very impressive is the degree of opposition to company brutality uh, in, uh, in British papers. And that there are satires on at the West End. Uh, there are uh, front page editorials. You know, the kind of campaigning journalism of the New York Times or The Guardian today is preceded 200 years earlier by equally outraged reports. And there are two whistleblowing books published in 1772 uh, both by East India Company outside, uh, insiders that tell uh, uh, first-hand accounts of brutality witnessed by uh, uh, a man called William Boltz, who was a Dutch uh, guy who joined the English East India Company, and a Scot from Edinburgh, Alexander Dow. And these two books uh, you know, blow open all this, which is one of the reasons for the collapse of the company, uh, for the regulation and the increasing attempts of the state to rein in this voracious... Uh, company, but because half the MPs had shares in it, and because it controlled half of British exports, uh, it was a monster which was very difficult to tame. I think we're out of time, I'm afraid. So thank you for listening to.